<laughs> right. Uh, so we were involved in projects with all sorts of infectious diseases, and you can see the children there with some of them. And that's where I really got interested in brain infections. And the biggest talk we've, uh, the biggest project we're just sorting at the moment. Some of you may be aware of this is UK Times, which closed about two years ago. But there's such a vast amount of data because we enrolled 3,000 children with meningitis and encephalitis into that study. So we're just looking at that data at the moment. Um, so what I'm going to talk about today are what are the causes of febrile encephalopathy. Um, but I'm going to concentrate on meningoencephalitis, and to do that, I'm going to use some of real cases, um, common and rare, and then discuss the issues in their management. Um, I probably won't have time for the research, really. I'm not going to talk about neonates. I'm not an expert in neonates by any means, and it's a whole different if, um, set of problems. And I'm not really going to talk about infectious diseases management because I would really be working in a team with my colleagues to get specific advice. I'm going to, I haven't got time to talk about non-infectious causes, which is another whole talk. Uh, and increasingly, we're learning more about non-infectious encephalitis. Um, if you want to learn about um, all vaccination, if you want to look about learn about coma, I recommend these guidelines, which are endorsed by the Royal College of Pediatrics and Child Health, and they were last updated in 2016. Management of the child with decreased consciousness. You can download those from the, the web, and they're excellent. And obviously, encephalopathy, uh, encephalitis is part of that guideline. And what I'm going to talk about is based on guidelines that I was involved in writing, which were published in 2012, which is actually a long time ago now. They need updating. And again, you can download these freely from the Encephalitis Society's website if you're interested. So don't worry about taking notes. This is all based on those guidelines, really. So just as a bit of a revision, uh, what does encephalopathy mean and what are the causes? And then what do we mean by meningoencephalitis and what are the causes? And to do that, we should think about the surgical sieve, which our junior doctors and medical students don't seem to know anymore, which is really sad because I think it's a brilliant way of thinking about the causes of any illness. So you can look up surgical sieve if you've never heard of that either. So in terms of CNS infections, meningitis means inflammation of the meninges, the, co the coating of the brain, the covering of the brain, one of them. And these children have typically have fever, headache, vomiting. They may have photophobia and they may have neck stiffness. Encephalitis means inflammation of the brain parenchyma, the substance underneath. And those children, by definition, are going to be more sick. They will have some of the features, but they may have behavioral change, psychiatric illness confusion, coma, focal neurological signs or seizures. And uh, encephalopathy is a kind of umbrella term, meaning a syndrome of altered consciousness. And many there are many causes, including infections, but obviously there are others going back to our surgical sieve, metabolic, toxic, vascular, etc. And vasculitis really is a strictly pathological diagnosis because we rarely do uh, take brain biopsies. We do do them. We did one on a child last week at Alder Hay, but it's rare. Um, and hopefully these children don't die either. But so really we're using uh, surrogate markers to look at that, including uh, imaging, EG, CSF, etc. And we can obviously do tests to look for specific viruses or pathogens if we can get some CSF. So I said already, inflammation of the brain is um, it's called encephalitis and there are direct infections. So many of them are viruses. And in this country, the commonest cause is HSV. Uh, and we also also have bacterial causes, including TB or, or streptococcal infection. And there's geographic variation, I'll come into that in a bit. And then we have non-infectious or co-infectious causes of encephalitis, which are equally as common, really. And uh, those presentations uh, are called, typically called ADEM, acute disseminated encephalomyelitis. Uh, RARA is acute necrotizing encephalitis. And there are some other clinical radiological syndromes. And I've got examples of a couple of those later in the talk. And then we have immune mediated or some of them associated with antineuronal antibodies, which are fairly new. We've, we've really discovered them in the last 10 years or so. And in children, it's rare to have perineoplastic encephalitis, but in adults, that's fairly common. So whilst encephalitis is uncommon, febrile encephalopathy is not. And the clinical presentation is variable and may actually be subtle, especially in children and in, in the immunocompromised. So you're all going to come across these children in the emergency department. This is the biggest study of, of encephalitis in England to date, and it's recruited 172 adults and children across three regions of, of England. Um, and it was published quite a while ago now, 2010. And as you can see, despite a huge, um, a huge panel of tests to try and come up with an answer for these patients, still a third of them have no definite diagnosis. 
the commonest cause in this country in adults and children is HSV. But you can see ADEM, which is the non-infectious cause, is a big chunk. And then we have TB, antibody mediated, and then small numbers for specific pathogens uh, down here at the bottom. And I think this is the first study really where we realised that autoimmune antibody mediated encephalitis was such a big problem. So we'll talk about Stephen and we'll come back to him as well and use him as a real patient. And um, we'll, we'll talk about him and use him as an example as a way of walking through one of these children. So he's 13 years old, a previously well boy, and he um, called his dad from school and said he had a terrible headache and he's never sick. So there's one of our first red flags. He came to the emergency department on a Saturday and was assessed and sent home. Then he came back to the a &E department on later that day, but also on Sunday and Monday. He vomited a few times. He had loose stools and tummy pain as well. And at this point, he was looking a bit vacant. He was excessively sleepy and he had a high temperature going up and down. So I think there should be another red flag there, really. Shouldn't if you've got a 13 year old boy who's come three times to the emergency department, uh, he needs to be seen by somebody senior. So on day five, he came back to our, our department again, and he had three, by now he'd had three brief focus seizures. He had a high temperature, and but he was still alert, um, and his coma score was 15. There was nothing to find specifically on examination, but the nurses were worried about him and said he was sleepy but rouseful and quite slow to answer the questions. So as a kind of learning point, Glasgow Coma Scale is not very good at identifying subtle encephalopathy. So what's our differential diagnosis? What are we going to do? And what treatment would we start? So this differential diagnosis for all my cases is fairly similar, really. But this is what was written in the notes. This child had, could have had a febrile seizure, and now is he postictal? We haven't got time to, to get any feedback, but I'm hoping that you're all thinking, well, hang on a minute, he's a bit old for a febrile convulsion. And also, he's a bit, it's a bit long to be postictal now. Could he have febrile encephalopathy due to rotavirus? This is what was written in the notes. Well, it's possible, but actually rotavirus isn't very common in 13-year-olds, is it? Uh, and um, it's more likely to be a toddler that would have something like that. And often they're afebrile. Could he have meningitis? And if so, could it be viral or bacterial? Or could it be encephalitis because he's a bit confused and sleepy? And again, we're thinking viral, bacterial or inflammatory. Or obviously, we're thinking about other causes of encephalopathy. So we had a set of bloods and they were pretty unremarkable except for us, an elevated peripheral white cell count. And at this point, we, the, the registrar took stock again. Um, and what would we like to do? We could do a CT scan, we could do a lumbar puncture, or we could admit them and observe them. Well, they did a CT scan. CT scan was reported to be normal. And then the lumbar puncture was considered but not undertaken because he actually looked a little bit brighter at this point. But I'd like to have a think about whether there's a contraindication to a lumbar puncture at this point, just amongst yourselves. And if, if we think about contraindications to lumbar puncture, meaning we need a CT first, then we think about signs suggestive of brain shift or a space occupying lesion. So things like focal neurological signs, papilledema, which is rare acutely, seizures, which he's had, deep coma, which he doesn't have, hypertension, bradycardia, which he doesn't have. And then other non more or less specific things like breathing disorders or sepsis, which are rare. So I would suggest he didn't have a contraindication at this point because he's had a normal CT scan to make sure he doesn't have uh, any of these things, brain shift or a space of lesion. Later that day, he had two more focus seizures. One of them was quite long. And his coma score is now fluctuating between 11 and 13. So he now got his number puncture, which I'm sure you can all appreciate was very abnormal. High, high white cell count and an elevated protein level. So we know it's, he's got a clear cytosis in the CSF. We know he's got a brain infection or brain inflammation now. Uh, that's definite. And uh, quite rightly, he was treated with ketotaxin and ocyclopine. He didn't get an MRI scan that night. He got one the next day. And I'm sure you can appreciate it's very abnormal. Uh, it's got diffuse swelling throughout the whole of the temporal lobe here on the right, which you can see uh, but on both these here, axonal and coronal. So um, have a think about what the most likely diagnosis is, and we'll come back to Stephen in a bit. So I'll move on to another boy, again a real patient, saw him a few years ago now, but he had had acute lymphoblastic leukemia in the past, uh, two years ago, and at this point he was on maintenance chemotherapy, but actually quite well. And he had a rocky start to his treatment because he developed venous sinus thrombosis and an infarction of the right temporal vital lobe 
a month into his chemotherapy, which is fairly common. At that point, he'd had seizures and a reduced level of consciousness, but he'd had a good recovery apart from some memory problems. He'd had intermittent problems with oral herpes infections since then. So acutely now, he's presenting with confusion, uh, a low grade temperature, a mild headache, he vomited, and he'd had a focal seizure, which was definitely a focal seizure was witnessed on the ward, um, but he has no focal neurological signs. So we go back to our differential, I'd say it's fairly uh, similar every time. I think we'd be very worried about infection at this point, and especially because he, he may well have some immunocompromise. So we think about standard things, but perhaps we should think about some less common uh, causes of uh, brain infection, TB, fungi, listeria, etc. Um, or could he have a relapse in his, his leukemia? Could he have something else going on, like demyelination, so could this be ADEM? You know, et cetera, et cetera. There's, there's other non-infectious things we should have a think about. And one of the commonest causes for a consult on the oncology board for neurologists is hypertensive encephalopathy because these kids get given a lot of steroids, but he didn't have hypertension. So we had a CT scan and there were no new changes and he had a lumbar puncture and just had a very mild elevation of white cell count, um, but it's still abnormal. This is his MRI scan. So they look a bit old now, don't they? Because they're obviously the quality of scans has, has got better. And you can see here on the right side, he's got these cystic changes in his right temporal lobe. That's fluid, black there, it's been replaced, it's big cysts. And that's from what happened to him when he had his induction in this. So uh, that's old, long standing. But, but you can see there are some high signal changes here in his left temporal lobe, which you can see on both slices, Groland, axial, and that's a bit of a worry, that's new. And the PCR in his CSF was positive for herpes simplex type 1. So he was treated with 21 days of IVA cyclovir, and then he had continued treatment with oral valet cyclovir, really not so much for encephalitis, but because he gets these oral uh, herpes lesions. And as time's gone on, he has definitely developed some new problems with his memory and behaviour. He went back to school after about six months, and he's carried on with his ALL treatment. They had a pretty good outcome. So there's a few learning points here. Older children do not have that one function, so I'm sure you will know that. Always do a lumbar puncture if you can. Don't put it off. Try not to talk yourself out of doing it. It can be so helpful. And uh, CSF white cell count may be normal or only slightly elevated in the immunocompromised or even early on in herpes encephalitis. And if you need help uh, with patients who are immunocompromised, you need to ask the infectious diseases team to help you uh, think about the investigations those children. And although HSV encephalitis in older children outside infancy usually causes no physical disabilities, it can have catastrophic neurocognitive and psychiatric problems, which when you first meet the patient, you might not realise how impaired they are. <laughs> okay, so how common is viral encephalitis? I'm going to skip over this because you can all go and read about this, but essentially each DGH hospital typically will have two to three cases in adults and children a year. So it's not that common. So that's each sort of reasonable size district general hospital. They're very important though, these brain infections, because they take up a huge number of uh, bed days for the hospitals. And if the case is mismanaged, I think this number's probably gone up since I wrote this talk. I I've got a friend who's a, a judge and she was telling me that typically patients will get 25 million pounds now for a mismanaged brain injury. She was telling me that last Friday. So I think I probably need to up that a little bit. Um, so we know that early treatment of HSV encephalitis and bacterium and just improves the outcome. And autoimmune cases need different treatment. So it has a devastating impact on those affected. Like I've just said, acyclovir, when it's introduced, reduced the mortality significantly. But those patients who survived had an increase in neuropsychiatric morbidity. And Less than 20% of adults who develop HSV encephalitis as an adult return to work. Uh, and severe disability is quite common in children, especially infants. So it has a huge uh, burden on the health services and the community. Well, why might we miss encephalitis? Well, first of all, we might wrongly attribute it to a patient's fever and confusion, such as a chest infection or a viral illness. That's probably more common in adults, isn't it? So elderly people where they get said to have a UTI, for example. 
ignoring relatives where the patient's behavior is not normal. Just, we've just seen that the, the coma score can be 15, but actually their behavior is not quite right. In adults, especially or perhaps teenagers, wrongly attributing cardiac consciousness to drugs or alcohol. And then failing to properly investigate a patient who has fever and a seizure. And that includes not doing a lumbar puncture, even if there's no contraindications. And then if we do do a lumbar puncture, not sending all of the CSF samples off or um, failing to understand some of the pitfalls. So this is a typical CSF results. And we've got, across the top, we've got acute bacterial meningitis, viral encephalitis, TB, fungi. And if we just concentrate on looking at viral meningoencephalitis, typically they don't have raised pressure. If you measure it, it should be very clear. Can have normal, uh, no cells, but you can have up to a thousand cells as well. And typically they are lymphocytes and you have a, typically a normal glucose ratio. Protein can be marginally elevated up to about one gram per litre. But there are some exceptions you need to know about. So early on, viral infections of the brain can give a neutrophilic or even a normal CSF. And the glucose ratio can be low, especially in some viruses like mumps and CMV. So if you're not sure, if you really think the patient's got encephalitis and you think you might have done your lumbar puncture too soon, it's perfectly reasonable to repeat it if needed uh, 24 hours later. And actually, bacterial disease can give a lymphocytic CSF, especially if a patient's partially treated or if they have listeria. This is also a really important slide. So early CSF can be normal in HSV encephalitis, which uh, goes on to be proven by PCR. Um, so this is a nice study looking at 38 children who had positive PCR for HSV. Eight of them had no white cell counts, uh, well, less than 10, and a normal protein. So it's definitely possible to get normal CSF, and you might want to repeat it if you really think they've got HSV. PCR is actually a critical test. Um, it used to take, in my hospital, about a week, and we have a real campaign on getting that sorted, and usually we can get that now within 24 hours, and we have these film arrays now, which looks at bacteria and uh, viruses in the same test, which is generally quite good. Um, although I do think occasionally you can over uh, diagnose HSV and be a bit too sensitive. But generally, the PCR sensitivity and specificity is 96% and 99% respectively, if the CSF is taken on the right day, so between two and 10 days from the onset of symptoms. So it's a pretty good test. What about imaging? Well, the CT is not that great. It, it can be normal in up to 30% of our children and adults who have HSV encephalitis. Um, MRI is better, and it's much easier to get an MRI scan now, even out of hours. And if, in particular, it's important to ask for diffusion-weighted images because they're more sensitive. And the lesions typically affect the frontotemporal and parietal lobes in older children. So you've seen this already in the previous uh, first, the first case. So you can see this low density lesion here in the left temporal lobe. And on an MRI, depending on what sequences you're looking at, that you see some high signal, high T2 uh, signal here. This is a flare sequence. It's identical to my third patient. It's not the same patient. They're very, very typical. Once you've seen it, you won't forget it and you'll it, it looks fairly typical. And that's DWI, so it picks up restricted diffusion uh, and it needs to be compared to an ADC now. We had a kid that we just happened to do MRS on. It's not something you would do routinely, and they actually get a double inverted peak here in lact of the lactate, which is quite typical. You usually see this in mitochondrial disorders, but I guess it's just showing uh, that the brain is, is, is not doing very well. There's high turnover of, uh, of metabolites for the brain. What about EEG? Well, it can be useful. It, it used to be the test before we had MRI. Um, and it typically shows generalized slowing. You may see both procedure activity, but you may see this thing, which is called periodic lateralizing epileptiform discharges. So for those of you who are familiar with EEG, if you're not, this is down the bottom here. This is usually seconds in time. So this strip is probably about 10 seconds of EEG. And you can see that on a regular basis, we get these big epileptic discharges coming through. Oops. And that's very typical. So you can see these are also in the front of temporal regions. If you see this, these periodic discharges are happening at that kind of frequency, that could well be HSV. And it was thought to be pathognomic, but actually, if you have a tumour there in that region or something structural, you'll probably get the same uh, changes. 
So other investigations that are worth considering in these patients are throat swabs, uh, nasopharyngeal aspirates, uh, rectal swab or a stool sample. And that's to look for PCRs for enteroviruses uh, or adenoviruses. Think about serology, things like mycoplasma. You could do some vesicle electromicroscopy PCR and culture if you've got lesions, so lesions on the hands or hepatic lesions around the mouth. Um, I very rarely would go on to do a brain biopsy if we're not getting anywhere. The child's very sick and we're thinking about treatment that might change the, out the outcome. Uh, and we're worried that the treatment we're going to give could make them worse. So that's rare, but we probably do well, we do several brain biopsies a year. And then there are some specific tests you can do on the CSF, which Public Health England provide, and that's to look for intrathecal antibody production to HSV. Um, and this is just an example of this. You can see this specific uh, HSV IgG here on this, uh, this strip. And that's, it's a very useful test, but if you get it later, you won't get it acutely. So what about, so these are sporadic causes of, hate, of, of encephalitis, and I've put the ones in purple that are the commonest in our country, so HSV, varicella, uh, and enteroviruses. But there are others, and then obviously if you live in different parts of the, country, of the world, you're going to see a, a different uh, geographic variation. And Japanese encephalitis, which we studied in Vietnam, is the commonest cause of encephalitis in the world, and it's spreading. It started off in, in Asia, but it's spreading now to other countries as well. It's a tick bit, so it's a mosquito-borne illness. So we've already discussed this. What are the classical clinical features of encephalitis? So flu-like prodrome, uh, rapidly followed by severe headache, nausea, vomiting, altered consciousness, seizures, focal signs, or meningism. Some of them may have movement disorders, particularly if the basal ganglia are involved. And this is a child from Vietnam who had Japanese encephalitis. It's hard to show on a photograph, but he had a really expressionless face, Parkinsonian type features. And his brain imaging showed these uh, high signal here in the basal ganglia. But you can have subtle presentations of encephalitis, uh, like our second patient with low grade fever, behavioural change, speech and language disturbance. So that's especially true in the immunocompromised children, such as those receiving cancer treatments or other immunosuppressants. And then if we have a child with a psychiatric presentation, we should really be thinking about autoimmune causes. Uh, and these are children who present with abnormal behaviour or even psychosis and cephalopathy. They may have uh, movement disorders, such as very marked choreoapatosis, and they may also have seizures. If you develop a focal uh, encephalitis affecting the brainstem, which is called rhomboencephalitis, uh, you may get signs associated with that area of the brain, so lower cranial nerve palsies, myoclonus, autonomic dysfunction, respiratory drive, Abnormalities, so these children may end up getting ventilated uh, or kind of locked in. And the causes of that would be enteroviruses, especially young babies, listeria, TB, Borrelia, Bartonella. So those are rare causes, aren't they? So if we go back to Stephen, think about um, how he's getting on. We think now it's pretty likely that he's got HSV type 1. We're still waiting for our viral PCR for CSF. So what treatment does he need? How long for? IV or oral, um, should we think about doing a follow-up lump puncture, um, and is there anything else we could give them like steroids? So these are some important questions. When should we start a cyclic like and when should we stop? And this is what actually happened. So when I came back from Vietnam uh, and became registrar in this country again, I was kind of a little bit shocked at what happened in the three years I was away. And it persisted really, and, and I just felt children were not getting the lymph nodes they needed in the A&E department, and there seemed a real reluctance to do them at this time. And this was published when this was published, 2009, a long time ago, but obviously started collecting the data a long time before that. And I think it really has improved. But at this time, we, we discovered really we found that there was an overtreatment and sometimes undertreatment um, with acyclovir, and if children had a lumbar puncture. Which was only happening in about 50, uh, it was only happening about 50% of the children that needed the lumbar puncture. Even then, the HSV PCR was only sent off on half of those children. So, the lumbar punctures where they were being done, even then, the HSV PCR was not being sent off. It doesn't matter if we undertreat with acyclovir. We know that relapse of HSV and cephalitis is, is reported in patients who are given less than 10 days, and uh, children with proven or strongly suspected HSV encephalitis should be given at least 10 days of treatment. So we all know how difficult that can be in little kids. 
Um, so actually, they may need a long line or a central line. And if you are going to stop treatment before 10 days, it might be perfectly okay to do that. But I'd really recommend that you document why you might be doing that, just really for medical legal purposes uh, and to just be clear in your own mind why you're stopping the treatment. So in adults, things done slightly differently probably to children. Most adults will get a CT scan and then a lumbar puncture uh, and they will then have treat. Treat them if the CSF is consistent with the viral encephalitis. Um, if the lumbar puncture wasn't possible, we treat them anyway. In kids, I think, you know, HSV is slightly more common. Um, and also having a normal CSS, CSF, as you've seen, is more common. So some argue that if you do a lumbar puncture for encephalopathy or uh, febrile encephalopathy, you should treat anyway and then wait for your CSF results. So we've now got our child on a site when are we going to stop? So the RCTs that were undertaken for HSV and encephalitis were for 10 days of treatment and some of those patients relapsed uh, when they've only received 10 days. So the general recommendation is 14 days standard treatment at present and as I've said already you can stop earlier if you've got another definite diagnosis uh, but we can really need to think it through and document that. If you still think the patient might have HSV, don't stop before 14 days if the PCR is negative, because you've just heard that it can be falsely negative in the first few days of the illness if the LP was done too soon. So you might want to do, repeat the CSF uh, at that point, because it's a big commitment to treat somebody for 21 days with IV treatment in the hospital, especially if they seem to be doing very well now. And if you get two negative um, PCRs, it's pretty unlikely to be HSV and you can safely start. Well, what about treating beyond 14 days? Some people would recommend repeating the LP and continuing if the PCR is still positive, which can happen. Um, in, our, in, our, in the guidelines, we generally recommend, uh, as personal practice, to treat for 21 days in the immunocompromised and also 21 days if HSV is proven and the patient is still improving. I mean, it doesn't happen very often. You know, I've just said get two to three patients a year in DGH with positive HSV PCR. So committing those patients to three weeks of IV treatment when it's so important uh, seem, doesn't seem too big a deal really. The only problem of course is with little kids is you may need to get a long line or some central access. So there was a study which looked at whether to continue oral treatment with valocyclovir after the three weeks of treatment and there was no benefit so there's probably no reason to, to do that. But we do know now that relapse in some children which can occur after um, HSV encephalitis is actually immune mediated and is associated with NMDA receptor antibodies. So obviously those children need a completely different approach. So this is a question you quite often get asked on the ward round, is it okay to switch from oral to oral acyclovir after five, six days of, of IV acyclovir? Well, I'm afraid oral acyclovir isn't really well absorbed. Um, if you're going to give oral treatment then you know you would be better off using ballet site beer, but the dose in children is not well documented really it has better oral bioavailability bio apparently it's now available as a liquid preparation but personally as i said if you really think a kid's got hsv encephalitis i would be committing them to 21 days of treatment uh, if it's not possible you might use oral ballet site beer after 10 days especially in children but it's hard to see why it wouldn't be possible really what about steroids? Well, we don't use them routinely, but there, might, there is some anecdotal evidence that they might be beneficial in, in, in HSV encephalitis. So you can see some edema here is reduced, the imaging looks better in this adult patient. Um, at the moment, I would reserve it for severe cases who've got marked cerebral edema or brain shift or raised pressure. But there's a trial going on at the moment, it's doing very well actually, I've just looked this up. There are 72 patients out of 90 who've now been recruited to this study. This is in adults only who've got proven HSV encephalitis and they're being randomised to receive dexamethasone or placebo. So we should get an answer really uh, looking at neuropsych outcomes and imaging outcomes on whether or not steroids are helpful for HSV. Uh, there are some other treatments which have been considered, so using IVIG for example, and there are some trials to suggest it can be helpful in specific encephalitis such as enterovirus and autoimmune encephalitis. So the question is, is it useful for, you know, should it be given early before we know what the, the diagnosis is? And uh, there was a study running actually with this recruiting patients for the early use of IVIG, but unfortunately um, it is now on hold 
had about him. It's on hold because of under recruitment. And actually, more than under recruitment, what we were finding was was well, people were reluctant to not give IVG. So uh, they had a sick patient with encephalitis. who weren't willing to randomise them, and they were just getting on and giving IVG, which is actually quite hard to understand how they were getting permission to do that from their trusts. But anyway, unfortunately, because of those things, uh, the trial's on hold at present. So I'll just talk about another patient who's a nine-year-old boy. And this boy became drowsy after chickenpox, and it was a primary chickenpox infection. So the rash started about six days ago, and it's just disappearing. We're very happy that's what the rash was. And he became confused and sleepy and started complaining of headaches. We had neck stiffness and a high temperature, and he's a bit confused. So he was sleepy but rouseful, but there were no other specific neurological focal signs. You know, here's, here's his investigations. He's got clear cytosis, 15 cells, mostly lymphocytes, and a slightly elevated protein. The PCR for viruses, including BZB, was negative on day two. And an MRI showed high signal in the basal ganglia. I think you can appreciate that here, right and left. I haven't got the MRA. It was hard to demonstrate actually on a on this um, on a kind of two-dimensional uh, picture, but it was abnormal and showed narrowing and irregularities of the supraclinal portions of the internal carotid, and that was felt to be in keeping with post varicella vasculitis. So varicella encephalitis is pretty rare. So in that study I showed you at the beginning, there were 10 patients who had uh, varicella encephalitis out of 203 in total, and six of them were immunocompromised. You may get uh, BZB DNA in PCR, but not always. And the commonest presentation really, pathology, is, is a vasculitis. Um, so these, treat, these patients should get given a cyclovir, but they should also get steroids, although unfortunately, because it's so rare, there's no specific evidence base for that. Um, but in children especially, the varicella may cause other neurological presentations, more commonly, I would say, and that would be the commonest is a para or post-infectious cerebralitis in toddlers. But stroke is quite common, uh, caused by uh, a large vessel vasculitis up to about six months after having primary chickenpox. Um, and uh, you can also have a presentation with myelitis or ADEM associated with chickenpox. So you just want to be on the lookout for and think about steroids in particular. OK. I'll move on to talking about an eight-year-old girl who had uh, upper, respir upper respiratory tract infection. She was found the next morning uh, vomited, eyes were open, not fixing the following, confused and agitated. And she uh, had, was deeply unconscious, home score of 10, high temperature, no rash, lymphadenopathy or meningism. Um, her pupils were four millimetres and reactive, uh, but she had low tone. There were no lateralizing neurological signs, but she had brisk reflexes, and, except for brisk reflexes and upward gain planted. So there was nothing asymmetrical, but there was a concern that she had some new neurological signs. In the past, this girl had three years previously presented with an influenza-like illness, and at that time she had been quite unwell in neurological as well. She was excessively sleepy and had reduced visual acuity and had a clear cytosis and a slight elevation of some of her NFTs, her enzymes, and had a scan which was thought to show changes consistent with ADEM, and she made a pretty good recovery, but she had been left with some mild cortical visual impairment and memory problems. And she had a follow-up scan three months later, which was normal. So this is a very interesting story. It's the sort of story that neurologists get very excited. So she is an eight-year-old girl with an acute febrile encephalopathy with a flu-like illness, and she'd had a previous mild episode. So the question is, are they connected? So let's go to our list again. We're thinking of brain infection and inflammation, meningitis, bacterial, viral, post-infectious, etc. Then we're thinking more widely about other conditions which might cause overlapsing encephalopathy, particularly mitochondrial-like uh, mitochondrial disorders. Um, you certainly have to be thinking about that in this child. So we have a look at our decreased coma score and we go through that. Um, we think about ammonia and other metabolic tests, and we arrange a CT scan, think about doing a liver puncture and start on the right treatment. So her bloods were normal. This is the second presentation, but she's got a bit of a lymphopenia. Throat swab was awaited. CT scan was very, very abnormal, as you can see here. Uh, she's got an abnormal, uh, size, uh, abnormal signal in the cerebellum and an acute hydrocephalus. So she was moved to our intensive care, ventilated, put a drain in and got some CSF. 
and uh, she had a group G streptococcus in her throat, but also influenza B. And her EG was abnormal, it was uh, epileptic pattern, non-specific, and this is her MRI scan, which obviously gives us a lot more detail. So you can see really abnormal signal in the cerebral hemispheres, also high signal here in the pons and midbrain, which looked almost nodular, uh, a rim like nodular enhancement, um, and uh, abnormal signal in the thalami and the white matter adjacent to the lateral ventricles. So really quite unusual picture. So we decided to get her previous imaging and have a look at it. Uh, so this is three years earlier, and we can see bilateral symmetrical hyperintensities in the thalami, uh, also in the internal capsules and external capsules. And there was also some abnormal signal in the ponds and the hippocampi. So a little bit unusual for Adam, I would say. So she did, she was really quite sick. She had severe brainstem features, uh, needed tube feeding, was given steroids and IVIG in kind of desperation, and then started to improve when we moved her EBD. And this is her eight weeks into her rehab, and she has continued to improve. Uh, at this point, she could wave, move her head, she had no speech, but a good understanding of language. But she has actually improved and she can talk again quite well now, and she can walk short distances as well. So we thought about this condition, which is uh, acute necrotizing encephalopathy, and sent off genetic tests, which showed she was a heterozygote for this RAN BP2 mutation, um, which is very rare. And she had inherited this from her father, who was at the current time asymptomatic. I think I've seen in my career about three children or three families with this. And we typically get about one, one a winter in the UK. Across. Now we, we, we communicate with each other quite well now really in our, in our specialist interest group and there's usually about one child a winter who will have this they usually don't do very well so this just shows you the neurological complications of influenza it's associated with influenza i'll tell you a bit more about it in a minute so if we look at this sort of pyramid at the bottom we've got encephalopathy um, and then we might have uh, patients who get posterior vertebral encephalopathy syndrome uh, then more severely might get malignant brain edema and at the very top end may develop this acute necrotizing encephalopathy, which is associated with the flu. And there are some other subacute or later onset uh, neurological problems as well. But I'm just going to concentrate on the acute ones. So uh, when I wrote this talk, there were about 50 cases reported in the literature, but I guess there have been a lot more now. It's just it's not so new, so it doesn't get reported as much. Um, it can affect children of any age, but they're often young children and it's associated with influenza A or B infection. And they often have this genetic predisposition that was first described in 2003. It's also more dominant uh, with a low penetrance. Um, but it's important to think about in any child who has a, a relapsing um, febrile encephalopathy, or if they have a family history of something like multiple sclerosis in a close family member, because it may well be this. Um, we don't really understand exactly what goes on in the course of the pathology. Uh, but it's a bit similar. Um, it affects this nuclear pore gene, so the mechanism is thought to be similar to a mitochondrial encephalopathy. About 30% of the children will die. So often they'll have abnormal liver function, which is another clue, have this very characteristic of imaging, and there's no actual evidence of inflammation, so it's thought to be an exaggerated immune response, like a cytokine storm. So because of that, there's no real treatment we can offer, but some will improve like our, our patient did. I'm just a bit anxious about the time. I know we had a late start, so I think I'm going to skip through this case just because uh, of time, but I'll send some PDFs and you can look at them afterwards if you're interested, so I'll skip through her. Another interesting case, but you can, we can come back to, you can have a look at the, the slides. So what I'd like to do is just touch on non-viral causes of encephalitis in the last few minutes that I've got, um, because I think this is very common and it, it's not something you think about perhaps from this angle, the neurological complications, um, just some food for thought really. So I'm going to try and think about the non-viral causes of encephalitis and again use it for patient to demonstrate the difficulties that, that bacteria can cause. So this was a baby and it's important to look at when they presented, 2006, which is just as we were bringing in uh, pneumococcal vaccine to all babies and this baby presented with fever, irritability, poor feeding, very non-specific things, no rash and when she came to our hospital she was unwell, 
um, prolonged pulmonary refill time, high temperature, bulging funds now, and very worryingly had abnormal posturing to pain. So a uh, very neurologically unwell child and signed with signs of raised intracranial pressure. So the concern is, has she got a bacterial meningoencephalitis in particular? Um, I think some of the other causes here are less likely. It's certainly possible she could have developed hydrocephalus. Uh, and here we go, there's a CT scan. She was ventilated for transfer. Uh, CT scan without contrast here shows an acute hydrocephalus. And she had a drain put in, CSF was turbid with really high white cells, and her uh, gram stain was positive for cocci. Really, really low glucose ratio, as you can see, really low and extremely high protein. And this was a, a strep pneumonia, polysensitive bacteria. And it was due, she was due to have her pneumococcal vaccine the next week. And this was one of the serotypes that would have been in that vaccine. So it was tragic. It's absolutely tragic, really. And hopefully you won't see so much of this. Now, but just to be aware, we do get the odd uh, child who is not vaccinated or has come from another country where they may not have received the same vaccinations as, as the UK-based children. So this is the MRI scan showing these horrible microabscesses in the white matter and basal ganglia, um, which enhanced the gadolinium. And just a quick last few slides to talk about bacterial meningitis. You, you've all seen patients with this. It's common. They have a clinical triad of fever, headache, and meningeal irritation. And the more severe children get involved with the brain parenchyma underneath, so they get a cerebritis. And the epidemiology is constantly changing due to the introduction of vaccinations. Most recently, uh, Hib is reduced. Um, but we do get different types of Hib now, Hib E and Hib F. Occasionally, we'll see it has quite a high mortality, um, and it's the fourth biggest cause of disability in low and middle income countries. So these are two uh, children here. We've got that neck arching due to severe meningism. I'm, not, I'm going to skip over this. You can look at this in any, any, any book or review. But just to say, if you're going to get bacterial meningitis, the worst one is pneumococcus. So just thinking about it from a neurological point of view, thinking about the neurological consequences of bacterial meningitis, well, it's, it depends on the severity of the infection, obviously, and it depends which parts of the brain are damaged. Uh, and then it may also depend on the specific bacteria. And then how the bacteria got into the CNS? Was it by the blood or did it spread locally? And then this is a list of complications uh, that I thought about um, in terms of the children I'd seen uh, when I wrote this talk. So unfortunately, well, it's very common to get brain edema, which can cause brain shift and lead to death. Um, children can sometimes just come in and die over sort of eight to 12 hours, really, with a comb from meningitis. Uh, they may develop a subdural collection, and that often happens slightly later on when they've just had antibiotics for sort of 10 days or so. And if they get a fever again, it's time to think about the development of a collection. You may, as we've just seen with this child, you may get septic emboli and abscess formation um, and cerebritis, so in, in, inflammation of the brain underneath the meninges. Because it's, these children are hypercoagulable, they may get venous sinus thrombosis uh, and have a, and have a, a stroke. Uh, they may have septic shock, coagulopathy, may present the seizures, hyponatremia. So if they have a basal um, meningitis, like from TBM, they may get cranial neuropathies. And then more generally, children can get ICU complications, such as aspiration, pneumonia, and rarely they can develop HLH linked to the meningitis as well. So this is a, a slide you wouldn't don't see very often and you would really wouldn't want to see very often. So this was a, a child that literally came in over eight hours uh, and died without even having a lumbar puncture. Um, so just showing here that the, the, the coning due to the bacterial meningitis. Well, what are the consequences of these complications? Well, clearly the most likely is brain damage. So cognitive damage, learning difficulties, they may develop hydrocephalus and need a shunt may develop motor complications. If they're young enough, we would call that cerebral palsy, or if not, we would just say they've had an acute brain injury. May have swallowing or oral secretion problems. Some of them may need a peg tube, may go on to get epilepsy, and then have behavioural problems, visual impairment, or multiples of the above. I'm going to skip over steroids. Essentially, uh, steroids should be given uh, if we can give them early before antibiotics. Um, and should really reserve it for cases where hip or strep is more likely 
don't give them in neonates. Um, but generally in this country, we don't, uh, they don't get given pre-treatment. So often it, it's best to then have a think about, if they've not been given then, it's best to have a think about whether it's safe to give steroids. I'd usually give them if a child is really sick on intensive care and they're not getting better and as part of their treatment for TBM. I'm not going to talk about TB. Uh, this is a slide from the TB guidelines, which were written uh, by Thwaites, just to show you that it's actually very safe to take CSF in children. Uh, these are the volumes that it's safe to take. So please don't worry about taking uh, CSF in babies and children. They make it at such a high volume, it's completely safe to take it. If it's safe to do the LP, it's safe to take some CSF. And if you, if you want to diagnose TBM, you need at least six mils of CSF to spin down. Uh, how am I doing, Mike? I've got one more case to finish. I think we can do one last case and then a couple of questions. Yeah, this is a really, really good case. So, a seven-year-old girl came in with a vesicular rash. It looked like chickenpox. Uh, started with one spot, then spread. And she has become unwell, really, with increasing fever, lethargy, headaches, and confusion. Um, she's fully immunised and she has asthma. When we saw her, she could have this widespread rash and a high temperature. And she looked quite poorly, really. Her comb score was 11 and she had a stiff neck holding her head as if she was in pain. This was the rash, which I'll just let you have a look at. I'm not really sure, it looks like chickenpox, we weren't that sure. There were some that were a bit crusty, that you thought, well, maybe let me let that one on her chin, but the rest were kind of underneath the skin. So, slightly unusual for chickenpox. Um, she's not been outside the UK. So, I think it's probably most likely this is an infectious encephalopathy, um, but we'd have to think about post or power infectious encephalopathy associated with the chicken pox and then others. So she had some bloods, high peripheral white cell count, very low sodium, uh, didn't have an LP at this point, um, but it's worth having a think about whether it's contraindicated or not at this point because the CT scan was normal. She was started on treatment, standard treatment, reduced fluids and her sodium started to improve and then she had a sudden deterioration with a reduced consciousness uh, very quickly um, and when she deteriorated she had signs of shock, stiff neck, arch in the back, her heart rate was dropping to 50s, blood pressure had gone up, the respiratory rate was much more technique and a high temperature and her score is now 8 so she uh, is really very sick and uh, signs of raised intracranial pressure so she was moved over to, I'm going to I have to whiz through really in, in terms of time. Um, she was moved over to us and again uh, had uh, intensive care support. Uh, CT scan repeated shows now shows acute hydrocephalus and she's needing systemic support. She had some CSF taken during her drain being put in and the, these little bacteria were seen. And uh, it turned out to be listeria, which is really quite unusual. And interestingly, she also had PCR from her skin lesions, which did show varicella. So she seems to have two infections going on. Uh, this poor little girl did okay in the end, but uh, she took a while. She was with us for quite a while, needed quite a lot of rehabilitation, and ended up with a shunt long term. And she has this persistent lymphopenia. And I think now, several years later now, the infectious diseases team have discovered she has got a genetic problem with her immune system, which could account for why she's developed listeria. So listeria shouldn't really affect uh, the immunocompetence, although it can. Uh, it's more typically affects young children or the elderly, and uh, obviously in pregnancy as well. Um, patients can have you know, tummy problems, a flu-like illness, or it can cause a septicemia, and then rarely it can cause a meningitis. And this was a picture I found um, from archives where I thought the rash looked identical really to the rash our girl had and it disappeared within a few hours of life. So it can cause this temporary uh, macular papular rash. I'll, I'll go over this. This is the, uh, an adult I met who had it as he was a doctor I worked with in a mess in India. So um, I'm not going to talk about the treatment essentially, but just to say there are reports in the literature, I mean this is quite an old paper now, um, 2012, where on the surface of it, 22 children who were immunocompetent developed listeria meningitis. So it's just to be aware of. And of course, for our patient, uh, although it's uncommon, 
she it meant she didn't receive her first line antibiotic for several days because it wouldn't have been covered by the antibiotics that she was on, which are the, the general antibiotics we use for meningitis. And I think there was a window where she could have had a liver puncture before she deteriorated, and that delayed her treatment really, which is, is a shame. So that's it. I'm not going to talk about that at all. I haven't got time to talk about COVID except to say we're in the middle of collecting uh, neurological patients or patients with neurological sequelae associated with COVID in adults and children. And the first paper was published on Saturday in Lancet Psychiatry. 153 adults, because there were no children at the time, who'd been reported a few weeks ago. But there are some children who, uh, a handful of children who've been reported, and I need to get all the details back on those children. So if you are aware of any children who may have had neurological complications of COVID, please ask your consultants if you can um, report them via the BPNSU website. Hopefully we'll get to hear about them all. Um, and finally, I'm just going to see if I can find the slide about there. I'll just leave that up while I take questions. So we run a course every year in neuroinfectious diseases course in Liverpool. Unfortunately, this year it had to be cancelled, but I think it's about 12 years now since we set it up. And it's a great two day course. It's actually very cheap. And it's in Liverpool Medical Institution, which is a lovely old, old building. And it's um, it gets really good feedback. So if anyone's interested in learning more about brain infections, please come to our course. Thank you. Thanks, Rachel. Really clear presentation, beautiful. And I went on that course, and it's a really good course. Um, so there's two questions about uh, HSV. Mm -hmm. um, so you told us about false negative um, HSV PCR when it's done too early. But the question here is, what are the chances of a repeat CSF being positive for HSV, um, maybe initial CSF negative, when acyclovir treatment has been commenced? So I think the question is about the effect of acyclovir treatment on whether you, whether you get a positive or negative HSV PCR result. Yeah, that's a really good question, isn't it? So you, if it was bacterial infection, then you'd be far less likely to get your answer. But this is, remember, we're looking at um, uh, genetic material from the virus. And that, that will still be there even with treatment. So it shouldn't affect it. It's still worth doing the second LP. Okay. And second question is from Noella Pereira. Can you comment on prophylactic oral acyclovir after completion of 21 days IV acyclovir for six months? What situation would you do that in? Um, yeah. So I think I, I, I give the, uh, the paper there. So there was a trial which looked at doing exactly that and they didn't find any benefit to, to doing that. I guess the only child you might consider it is like the patient we had with cancer who was having problems anyway with oral stomatitis, but in general, you don't need to do that. So it's a case-by-case -case basis, I, I would say, and discuss them very carefully with your infectious diseases colleagues as well, because you'd want to share the responsibility for that. Because um, ballet cyclovir and oral uh, acyclovir are not without risks are they so if there's no clear benefit i wouldn't routinely do it okay thanks rachel so I'll probably um leave it there as we ran a bit late starting but thanks yeah. thanks to rachel i've put the link for the coroner study on the chat and yeah. um one more link here for the learning pack which does have a case that's relevant to this um presentation oh there's one last last minute question last minute question rachel fine yeah what, what was the indication for ct scan in the first patient if normal GCS and seizures stopped, uh, what are the indications for CT in general in patients with fever and seizures? Yeah, so I think if you're 13 and you have a focal seizure with a fever, that's not normal. So I think that would be a very good indication to do a CT scan, having a focal seizure with a fever. Because hmm. you want to make sure that they haven't got uh, a space like a brain lesion or brain shift before you do your LP. Hmm. Okay. Thanks a lot. Hey, thank Make you. Everyone. Next talk will be tomorrow at one o'clock. We've got two great talks on epilepsy tomorrow. Thank you.